as we've seen, we have a wedge of a circle of radius 3, a 90 degree wedge extending from the x-axis to the y-axis in the first quadrant. That wedge can be described in terms of cross sections parallel to the y-axis. For every value of x between 0 and 3, y goes from 0 to square root of 9 minus x squared. So if x is here, y goes from here to here, and these would be the limits on y. Alternatively, we could describe in terms of cross sections parallel to the x-axis so that the value of y would be constant. y can take any value between 0 and 3 and for any value of y, x runs from 0 to the square root of 9 minus y squared. Either description can lead us to an integral of a given function over this plane region, over this wedge, if the function is f of x, y equals 1 over the square root of x squared plus y squared, for example, uh, our integral of this function over this region could be written like this in terms of the first description with cross sections parallel to the y-axis. And an analogous integral could be written with cross sections parallel to the x-axis using these limits, reversing the order of integration the result would be the same. The integrals would give us the same final value. Now this function can be conveniently expressed in terms of polar coordinates because square root of x squared plus y squared is just r in polar coordinates. And theta doesn't really appear in any way in this integral so that we could integrate this function f of r theta in polar coordinates. And in order to set up that integral in polar coordinates, the first thing we need to do is partition our intervals. Now the polar coordinate description here is uh, theta runs from 0 to pi over 2, r runs from 0 to 3. So these are the intervals that need to be partitioned. We can write our partitions as 0 equals theta sub 0 less than theta sub 1 less than so forth up to theta sub n which is pi over 2 and r from 0 to 3 so 0 would equal r naught which is less than r1 and so forth up to r n and I don't want to use the same symbol here so we're going to make this a theta m and an rn, rn equals 3. In any case, this is a perfectly reasonable partition. Each partition has a typical ith or jth interval. So we'll look at how that works out. But first, let's consider just what we mean by a theta interval or an r interval. A theta naught is 0, so we have a theta here. And that corresponds to a radial line making an angle of theta naught or zero with the polar axis. And then theta one corresponds to a radial line with angle theta one. Theta two, another radial line, its angle with the polar axis would be theta two. And that would be this angle in here. Now we could continue listing these. We would have a, uh, without labeling them, we think of this as resulting in a series of, that last one should be right along the y-axis, a series of wedges defined by constant values of theta. Similarly, similarly uh, the radius r naught would correspond simply to a point at the pole. r1 would be correspond to a circle, small circle of radius r1. r2 another small circle, radius r2 and so forth. As our radius r increases from 0 to 3 we get a series of 
quarter circles in this case. Of course, these would be part of a circle. And uh, these circles are getting a little warped. It looks like I'm trying to avoid my labeling down here, but let's see if we can straighten that out a little bit. So we divide our region into a number of rings. If these circles extended all the way around, uh, we would have rings. A ring, for example, between R1 and R2, and our typical ring between some arbitrary R sub i and R sub i plus 1. This process divides our region into small area increments. So here would be a typical increment the way I've sketched these intervals. We're going to let this increment correspond to the ith r interval. Okay, uh, the ith r interval uh, would be between this distance and this distance, between this ring and this ring, and the jth theta interval. And this would be our area integral delta A sub ij. So delta A sub ij is characterized by the ith r interval, the jth theta interval, and there's a sample point which we're going to call r sub i star theta sub j star. And that's any point within this area increment. Our strategy for constructing the interval is simply to evaluate our function at this point, and the function that we'll evaluate will be the polar function, function in this form, and the area of this integral. Uh, interval. So we have to have an expression for the area of the interval and an expression for the function as evaluated at the sample point, and both the area and the value of the function will be determined by values taken at our sample point. In the next clip, we'll proceed to construct our integral.